we have a long history in psychology of people influencing the behavior of others without being aware of it. Um, there's a, a study by uh, Rosenthal and Jacobson back in 1968 called the Pygmalion Effect. Uh, Pygmalion in the Classroom was the name of the study. Um, and it's named after the George Bernard Shaw play, right? And what they did was they, they brought an experimenter into a classroom, uh, in an elementary school classroom. And they went through and they, you know, wrote down a bunch of stuff and gave the kids a bunch of tests. And they came back to the teacher and said, little Jimmy and Jane and uh, Ralphie and so on, they picked out a bunch of kids and said, they're due for an intellectual growth spurt. Right? So the idea was these kids were about to blossom. Right? They're about to have this big, like a physical growth spurt, only intellectual. Right? And then they came back at the end of the year and they tested all the kids again. And lo and behold, these kids that they said were due for an intellectual growth spurt, in fact, had advanced significantly more than the rest of the kids in the class. The hitch is they just pulled those names out of a hat. They, they had no way of predicting intellectual growth spurts or anything like that. They just made it all up. So what happened? Well, the argument was that the teachers, although they claimed not to be, were treating these kids differently. Right? So if you know little Jimmy's ready for an intellectual growth spurt, right, and he's not quite getting something, well, you spend a little bit of extra time, you know, because you have these higher expectations of him. And we know if you have higher expectations of kids, they're going to live up to them, right? Or at least they're going to attempt to live up to them, right? And so a little bit higher expectations, you get a little bit higher results, right? A little bit higher performance. And that's what, that's what happened, right? And so that's an experimenter expectancy effect. Hmm. The experimenters were kind of expecting this, this outcome. In this case, the experimenters are the teachers in the classroom. And it's their expectations that the kids are li um, living up to. Sounds very similar to the clever Hans effect. Is that, I uh, can't remember the details exactly, but something about a horse being able to uh, read the, uh, the signals provided by the trainer you know that example? Yeah, um, back in the late 1800s, so the turn of the previous century, a guy named uh, Wilhelm von Austin. He was a retired school teacher. He thought the so-called dumb animals, as they were called at the time, were getting short shrift, that they were a lot smarter than people thought they were. And so he trained his horse to do all kinds of amazing things. So the horse could tell you what time it was, he could do um, arithmetic, he could convert fractions to decimals and decimals to fractions. You could ask him questions like, well, if it's 25 to 8, where's the little hand on the clock? What numbers is it between? Right? And so on. And they had these big commissions of inquiry who, 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 who uh, you know, came to check out Hans and make sure that there wasn't some fraud going on and so on. And he passed all the tests. How does the, how does the horse respond in this case? Well, actually, a psychologist named Oscar Funks came along yeah. and figured out what was going on. And what was going on in this case, I mean, Hans was very clever, but he couldn't talk, right? Yeah. It wasn't Mr. Ed. Yeah. So what he would do is he would just tap his foot to answer a question. Mm -hmm. What Oscar Funks um, established was that Hans could answer the questions if anybody in the audience knew what the answer was. Von Austin didn't, didn't need to be there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but someone had to know the answer to the question. And the way he tested this is he would ask one person to whisper a number in Hans's ear, another person to whisper a number in the other ear, say three and two, right? And they would ask Hans, add those two numbers. What's the sum of those two numbers? And Hans would go, and just keep going. Because no one was telling him when to stop. Someone always told him when to stop. And the way they did that, Hans was very clever, not in the way that, that people thought, but he was very tuned to very subtle movements of people. So as Hans started to approach the right answer, people would just lean forward a little bit in anticipation mm. of that answer. And so if he's going to five, you know the answer is five, you go one, two, three, four. Oh man, he's gonna make it there, five. <sighs> now, not nearly as big, but they were very subtle movements, but that's what Hans was picking up on. And once Funks figured this out, well, he'd get Hans to give whatever answer he wanted simply by making these movements deliberately. So Hans was picking up on these subtle cues from the people around him, none of whom knew they were doing this. 
right? There's no reason to believe that von Austin, who was the guy that was, um, uh, who had trained Hans, knew that he was cueing Hans the answers, right? He was, um, <clears throat> he had, he had a, a point to make, sure, but he wasn't a fraud, he wasn't making money off this. He just thought Hans was as clever as he was and didn't realize that he was doing the, the actual um, queuing himself. Or other people in the audience were doing the queuing when Von Austin wasn't there, because they'd often test without Von Austin being there. As you would think, well, I've, maybe he's up to something fishy, take him out of the room, test Hans. Hans works just fine, mm -hmm. right? As long as somebody knows the answer, because they give those subtle little cues as to where you should be going. Mm -hmm. right? And if you think about facilitated communication, you've got someone holding onto your sleeve or holding onto your arm, helping you reach out and point and, and touch a keyboard. Very easy for that person, without meaning to, to be guiding your hand in a particular direction. And so the, um, the client is simply sort of passing on the movements that have been started by the facilitator. So that's how you get the information from the facilitator out through the client. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice for uh, the people who are taking the course on how to improve their everyday thinking? I think at least part of the answer is a healthy skepticism. The, the rallying cry of the cynic is bullshit. Right? That I just don't believe anything. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm suggesting. What I'm suggesting is being skeptical. Say, let's see some proof. I want to see some evidence. So particularly when you see these kinds of claims, where's the evidence? How can we know this for sure? Uh, I think part of being skeptical is keeping an open mind, right? but demanding evidence and not jumping to conclusions, not, not making up your mind too early that either this is you know, a wonderful thing or it's completely bogus, right? My name is Scott. I think about evidence.